Hello, I am Lawrence Holgate, the author of Understanding John Locke, the uh, Smart Student's Guide to Locke's Second Treatise of Government, and we are now at episode 10. The title is Paternal Power and Conjugal Society. This is a rather long chapter. I'm going to you, I'm going to go ahead and do paternal power first, and then we'll turn to conjugal society as a uh, episode 11. It's quite surprising to find chapters on paternal power and marriage in a book on political philosophy. A discussion of these topics is not only unprecedented in the long history of scholarly research in political theory, but it has not been repeated since the publication of Locke's second treatise. Perhaps this explains why these chapters that I'm reading from are rarely mentioned in classroom lectures, discussions, and books about Locke. And I think that there are two good reasons why Locke's theories about paternal power and conjugal society are importantly relevant. First, the uh, chapter that I'm reading from and the first part of chapter 7 of the book I'm reading from in Second Treatise are the only chapters in which the reader is given a detailed account of how Locke understands the moral relationships existing within an important subgroup of persons, namely families who reside in the state of nature. And secondly, the discussion of paternal power sets the ground for an earlier premise to draw a promise, a distinction between paternal, political, and despotic power. So let's get started with paternal power in the state of nature. Locke tells us that both the state of nature and civil society are communities, and although Locke never defines the word community, One obvious distinction between the natural and civil community is that only the civil community is intentional. The civil community, also known as society, is created by a unanimous contract. That's what I mean by intentional. The natural community is not the product of a social contract or any other social agreement or promise between its members. At the same time, we can assume that people living in natural communities don't spend their lives isolated from each other. Although Locke earlier referred to people in the state of nature as independent, he must have realized that the men, women, and children in the state of nature will belong to one or more of a large variety of small communities or social groups. Groups like tribes, clans, friendship groups, villages, neighborhoods, and of course, families. What is it that binds the members of these communal groups together if there's no positive law and no process of adjudication available to interpret that law to settle disputes and controversies that might occur in members of natural communities? Well, Locke uses the parent-child relationship to illustrate how he answers this question. The community of parents and children, let's think about that. Parents and their children according to Locke, have rights and obligations that arise simply because of the familial familial relationship. The content or kind of rights and obligations each possesses will vary depending on such factors as the age of the child and the degree of infirmity of their elderly parents. So what are these parental rights and obligations? In the state of nature, we can assume that the family, consisting of mother, father, and their children, would constitute a small community on its own. And in this natural natural sub-community, the parents, quote, have a sort of rule and jurisdiction over their children. I'm quoting from Locke now. But this is only temporary. This is a quote from uh, paragraph 54 of Second Treatise. Children will grow up. They acquire age and reason, and eventually they will have equal rights to natural freedom without being subject to the will or authority of their parents. Now, while young children are under the dominion of their parents, the parents have a natural obligation, quote, to preserve, nourish, and educate the children that they had begotten. Paragraph 56. 
Unlike the obligations that the parents have to all others under the law of nature, parental obligations are specific and partial. They apply only to their biological children, not to all children, and children have reciprocal positive rights to be preserved, to be nourished, to be educated by their parents, not by other adults. For example, Marissa and Bernard have an obligation to feed, clothe, and educate their children, but they have no natural obligation to feed, clothe, and educate the children, the, their children named Aurora and Victor. Baron is the child of Donald and Hortons and has a natural right to their care and protection, but Baron has no right to the care and protection of unrelated adults, like Marissa and Bernard. Sorry about all the names. Parents also have a specific power over their children. It is the power or right to restrain their children from behaving in ways that could cause them harm. They also have the power, by the word power I mean right, they also have the power or right to force their children, if necessary, to do things that will benefit them. For example, going to school, eating nutritious food, getting sufficient sleep at night. The power that parents have over their children quote, arises from the duty that is incumbent on them to take care of their offspring during the imperfect state of childhood, close quote. In other words, these parental powers are parasitic on parental obligations. If the parents did not have obligations of support and protection, they would have no right to command the obedience of their children. This imperfect state of the young child is not just a deficiency of the body, it is also a deficiency of knowledge and reason, without which a child cannot be under the natural law. That is, we're not going to assume that the children have any idea that there is a natural law or that they wouldn't understand it, so they couldn't be under it. Nobody can be under a law which is not promulgated to him or her, and this law being promulgated or made known by reason only, he that cannot come to the use of reason cannot be said to be under this law. That's paragraph 57. A useful analogy would be to a law that is written in a language unknown to you. This law is not promulgated to you, and thus you cannot be said to be under the law, in the crucial sense that this law cannot serve as a guide to your future behavior. By analogy, the young child cannot enjoy the same liberty of action and expression that is in, enjoyed by his parents. According to John Locke's predecessor, Thomas Hobbes, children only have duties of obedience to their parents, and they have no rights to their protection. From the time of their birth, children are in the most absolute subjection to them. This is Hobbes talking now. And the parents may alienate them, that is, assign his or her dominion, by selling or giving them in adoption or servitude to other people. Or they may pawn their child for hostages or kill their child for rebellion or sacrifice them for peace by the law of nature when he or she, in his or her conscience, think it to be necessary. That's a quote from Hobbes. Hobbes justifies all of this on the grounds that the child tacitly consents to this subjection. You'd have to read Hobbes's book, Elements of Law, 23,8, published in 1640. Remember that those words. According to Hobbes, children are in the most absolute subjection to their parents. And the parents can do almost anything they want to their child. But this parental dominion over children only lasts a short while until the child reaches the age of reason. It is possession of the faculty of reason that provides the ground of freedom, the liberty of acting according to one's own will. If a child is turned loose to an unrestrained liberty before he has reason to guide him, this does him no favor. It is, quote, to thrust him out among boots and abandon him to a state as wretched as much beneath that of a man as theirs. Paragraph 63, Second Treatise. Therefore, the authority to govern the minority of their children is put into the hands of their parents, although the parents are only the temporary custodians. They're not the owners of their biological children. Hobbes gives us an ownership uh, idea here with respect to the relationship, and while the relationship that Locke is talking about is much more of the caretaking sort. 
The 19th century social philosopher Herbert Spencer rejected both Hobbes' and Locke's claim that children can justifiably be restrained by their parents. Spencer wrote that the child has the right to exercise all his faculties, even if his faculties are less than those of an adult. Quote, for to say that the rights of the one is less than those of the other, because his faculties are fewer, is to say that he has no right to exercise the faculties that he has not got. Thus, an infant has as much right to exercise his diminished mental ability to foresee danger as an adult has to exercise his greater, greater ability to do this. And using Spencer's logic, the parents would be wrongfully abrogating the child's right to wander into the roadway by pulling the child back before she is struck by a car. Uh, this is why Spencer is not usually quoted when we're talking about the relationship between parents and children. Uh, Spencer wrote these words that I quoted from a book called Social Statics, not statistics, Social Statics, S-T-A-T-I-C-S, published in 1851. Most libraries, university libraries, will have that book. So we've looked at Locke. We've compared Locke to Thomas Hobbes. We've uh, compared Locke uh, to Herbert Spencer. And we're going to go on right uh, uh, now to uh, Children's Rights and Obligations. I'm still reading in Chapter 6 of my book. Uh, in, in in the same chapter, it'll, it would be at... Uh, if you, you've got the paperback version, I'm reading from page 81, which is section 6.1.1.2. Sorry for all the points. Uh, this is titled Children's Rights and Obligations. Before the child comes of age, she has rights that are reciprocal to the obligations of her parents. It is because the parents have a God-given obligation to feed, clothe, and shelter their children that the children can claim a reciprocal right to food, clothing, and shelter. When the child reaches the age of reason and can take care of herself, both the parental obligations and the child's rights disappear. After the child comes of age, and Locke puts this at 21 years, the grown child no longer has an obligation to obey her parents, although she does have an obligation to honor them. And this is a perpetual obligation, which demands that the child not do anything that would ever injure or affront, disturb or endanger the happiness or life of those from whom she received her life, using Locke's words. She must also defend her parents and provide them with relief, assistance, and comfort whenever this is needed. This obligation is not only dictated by, quote, the law of God and nature, but it arises from the fact that her parents gave her life and made her capable of any enjoyments of life. The honor due from a child places in the parents a perpetual right to the child's respect, reverence, support, and compliance, too, as the father's care, cost, and kindness in his education has been more or less, paragraph 66. It's tit for tat. It's a reciprocal relationship. So for every obligation that the child has, you'll see a reciprocal right, and vice versa. There are sub-communities in the state of nature. Let's go back to that. We are in the state of nature, by the way, not in a political society. And I'm going to talk about sub-communities in the state of nature. The family is a sub-community of the larger community that comprises all persons in the state of nature relationships. What can we extract from what we have learned about parent-child relationships that we can apply to other sub-communities in the state of nature? And I think that, that Locke has implicitly told us much more than what he explicitly reveals in Second Treatise. Other than the conjugal contract between husband and wife, which we're going to discuss later, the family is a sub-community that is not created by contract between its members. The obligations and rights that parents, children, and siblings, siblings acknowledge and act on do not come about because of any agreements that they have made with one another. The family is not the only sub-community in the state of nature, as mentioned in the introduction of this chapter. There are also tribes, clans, villages, friendship groups, and neighbors. The late philosopher John Ladd uses the example of a person's relationship 
with neighbors in a village. This may involve many different activities and concerns, ranging, for example, from helping them to put out a fire to lending eggs or a ladder or to help to take care of a sick child. Being in a village or in a family, a clan or a tribe, allows us to say, for instance, you are in our community, therefore you should help us raise the new barn, or you belong to us, therefore we must care for you, or mutatis mutandis, you must care for us. But none of these special obligations arises from agreements or contracts between the village members. There were no occasions when village members expressly consented to be a part of the village, and each villager promised the others that they would come to their aid whenever this was needed. Was needed. Second, natural communities are not organizations or associations created by their members to serve specific interests, goals, or purposes. The local stamp club was formed because its members wanted to learn about stamps and stamp collecting. That is its purpose. But the family into which we are born and reared is not an organization. It was not intentionally formed for any purpose at all. Siblings and parents each have their own individual goals as members of the same family, but the family itself to which they belong has no purpose. The same can be said for tribes, clans, friendship groups, neighborhoods, and small villages. A third feature of natural sub-communities is that the duty of care that members have toward other members of the community is specific and partial. These duties are not mentioned in the law of nature. The natural law, according to Locke, is universal and impartial. The obligations not to harm others in their lives, liberty, health, or possessions is a duty that applies to all persons in the state of nature. But the duty of a parent to care for her child applies only to her child. She has no universal obligation to care for all children. You have a duty to help your friends because they are your friends. You do not have a duty to help my friends unless my friends are also your friends. The expectations about who has the special duty and who will benefit will vary widely between different kinds of community. Thus, in many cultures, a parent has no obligation of care toward the children of strangers, nor a duty to attend to the needs of elderly strangers. Parental and filial obligations extend only to one's own children and one's elderly parents. But this is certainly not universal. In some African-American communities, the obligations of raising a child may extend to all the children in the neighborhood. In Hopi tribes, the obligation of a grown child's support and care is only to the child's mother and her clan, not to the father, even though they feel more love for their father than they do for their mother. Finally, while Locke stresses the independence of people in the state of nature, members of natural subcommunities are often profoundly dependent. By independent, Locke means that each person is free to do as he or she wishes without having to ask for the permission of any others. But these same persons will also belong to a family, tribe, village, and to other natural communities. In the context of their membership, each person will depend on others in the community to give them help and support when this is needed and when they are able to provide. A member of a tribe is not only dependent on other tribal members for protection from external threats, but also for food and shelter in times of distress. Elderly parents are dependent on their grown children for help when they become infirm and unable to care for their own physical needs. Close friends and neighbors can depend on each other to look after their house, pets, and even young children when they are called away on a family emergency. They do not think of this as supererogatory, that is, above and beyond the call of duty. They understand that these duties of care are part of what it means to be a close friend or neighbor. Well, that ends uh, my description and uh, help for people like uh, you, my listener, to understand John Locke's unique chapter on paternal power. Uh, we were reading from uh, chapter 6 of the second treatise. If you want to read along with me, um, then uh, you can get a copy of Understanding John Locke at Amazon.com. Just use my name uh, to, uh, to get to the detail page on Amazon where you can um, pay a very low amount. I'm not going to mention it here. 
a very low amount for the book, uh, especially for the digital copy. Um, it is uh, the second book in my Smart Student's Guide to Locke's Second Treatise of Government. Well, thanks for listening, and uh, we'll see you next Monday. I'll try to, I'm going to produce this one for the coming Monday, and we try to do this at least once a week. Sometimes I do it more than once a week, so just just keep looking each time at your, at whoever it is that is uh, broadcasting this podcast. Thank you and good day.